This meeting is being recorded. Great. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we're very happy to have uh, I mean Kaja Ogun today for our last talk of our mini series on statistical physics on non-mutable graphs. Uh, we're talking about metastability of the plots for our magnet. All right, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak in this seminar. And um, so I don't really know how much of a background in statistical physics or mathematical physics you all have. So I'm, I decided to take it easy, I hope. But if anything is unclear, just feel free to interrupt at any time and, and ask. Um, all right, let's begin. So um, over the last 20 years or so, um, the, the area of probabilistic combinatorics, the theory of random structures like random graphs, random matrices, random codes, random formulas, and so on, has um, benefited quite a bit from impulses from um, statistical physics. And in particular, a lot of mathematical work and a lot of work in computer science has been devoted to rigorously vindicating or on occasion even disproving some of these predictions um, that physicists put forward on uh, the basis of a heuristic method that they call the cavity method. And um, this work has led to some breakthrough results, some celebrated results that um, received best paper awards at important conferences, like for example, work on low density parity check codes um, has been very influential. Um, at this point, we know, for example, that um, these randomly generated LDPC codes are capacity achieving on um, memoryless channels. There's been a um, important line of work on the random case up problem, for example. And more recently, there has been interest in um, statistical inference problems and um, techniques such as the approximate message passing algorithm and uh, signal processing applications like compressed sensing, for example. Um, one of the challenges is, of course, to kind of provide a rigorous foundation for these physics ideas. And um, this is what this talk is going to focus on as well. And in particular, we are going to focus on the connection between um, one of the workhorses of the cavity method, which is the belief propagation message passing technique. Um, and dynamics, the behavior of Markov chains, such as uh, the Glauber dynamics uh, for the POTS model, or um, something called the swenson wall dynamics for the POTS model. And uh, broadly speaking, in, in not just the POTS model um, on random graphs, but in many other problems as well, the hypothesis is in physics that under certain technical conditions, um, the fixed points of this belief propagation message passing scheme are in correspondence with important um, sets of configurations um, called metastable states that have an influence on the behavior of dynamics. In particular, if your system contains several of these metastable states, then we generally expect that dynamics such as Markov chains um, are torpid rather than rapidly mixing. And this is what we are going to investigate with the, conc with the concrete example of uh, the POTS ferromagnet on a random graph. So just to remind you what the POTS ferromagnet is, um, if you consider any given graph G, then we can define a probability distribution that we call the POTS model. Um, so in addition to the graph, you have a number Q of colors and um, this number is at least two, it's normally at least three. And um, this brackets Q symbol is supposed to be the set of um, the Q colors that you have at your disposal. The configurations in this model, the um, objects, the microscopic objects that the model talks about are simply colorings of the vertices of the graph. So every vertex receives one of the Q possible colors. And um, the POTS model is uh, simply this probability distribution, he also called the Boltzmann distribution, um, mu g beta of sigma, that says um, the probability of a configuration sigma is given by or proportional to exponential of beta times hg of sigma, 
a HD of sigma is nothing but the number of monochromatic edges. Um, and of course, in order to get a probability distribution, you need to normalize this normalizing quantity Z beta of G is called the partition function. And in this model, beta is a non-negative parameter called the inverse temperature. Um, and to summarize what you see here is that this model rewards monochromatic edges. Um, so it gives higher weight to configurations that have many monochromatic edges, higher probability mass. Um, that said, of course, there's like always in these statistical mechanics models, a trade-off between entropy and energy, in this case, entropy and the number of monochromatic edges. For small values of beta, if your temperature is high, if the inverse temperature is low, what is going to happen is that the model is very entropic. Um, it favors entropy. And we would normally expect that the Boltzmann distribution concentrates on configuration sigma, where all the colors are approximately equally popular. There are, um, we have color classes of about equal sizes. By contrast, if you make beta quite large, what we expect to see is something like one dominant color um, and then um, the remaining colors with about equal frequencies. So that's what, I mean, it, it doesn't work like that on every graph G, but that's broadly what we tend to expect um, in, this, in this model. And of course, there's going to be, or we, we would expect that there is some sort of a phase transition that separates the entropic regime from this, where, where all the colors are about equally popular from the regime where um, one color strictly dominates. Now, um, we are not going to look at this model on arbitrary graphs G, but rather on random regular graphs and um, specifically on sparse random regular graphs. So we fix a degree D, which is an integer at least three and take some large number N of vertices and then choose this uh, graph G, G and D, um, uniformly at random from all the set uh, from all the deregular graphs on n vertices. And um, as usual in the theory of random graphs, we are going to be interested in uh, the limit of large n. So the question is what events occur with high probability, meaning with probability approaching one as n goes to infinity. Um, just to give you an idea what the structure of this graph looks like, this random regular graph for, uh, is typically connected, it's, it's connected with high probabilities. So we, so we have only just one um, component. And on the other hand, it has very few short cycles. So if you take um, a vertex in this random regular graph and explore its neighborhood up to some depth, um, what you're going to see is simply just a deregular tree. So this model doesn't contain a lot of short loops. It's locally tree-like and uh, globally it's of course connected. And in fact, um, it's, it's a very good expander. So globally it has very good expansion properties. Um, just to, I mean, stress this viewpoint um, once again, what we are interested in is the typical properties of the Boltzmann distribution on a random graph. So that means that we, in physics lingo, quench uh, the disorder, fix condition on the random graph. And for a typical specimen of the random graph, we are going to be interested in um, the shape of the Boltzmann distribution. So this means that there's two sources of randomness or two layers of randomness here, if you like. On the one hand, uh, we have on the outer layer, if you like, we have the choice of the random graph. Um, and on the inner layer, we have the Boltzmann distribution and samples, um, configurations, sigma drawn from the Boltzmann distribution. Um, and what we're interested in is what the Boltzmann distribution looks like for a typical graph G. So we are not somehow intermingling these two levels of randomness, but we are separating them. The, first choose a typical random graph G and then we want to investigate its Boltzmann distribution. Um, 
Right. I mean, of course, there has been quite a bit of related work on this model already, and um, I'm not going to be able to give a full overview of the literature, but uh, suffice it to say that um, the partition function um, has been investigated quite a bit in this model, and also the behavior of dynamics has been investigated. Um, one of the articles that we are going to build on um, is um, co-authored by um, Galanis, Stefankovic, and Vigoda and Yang. And uh, three of them, of course, co-authors on the present work as well that I'm presenting. And um, so this work in particular, I mean, it wasn't the main focus of this work, but um, it was necessary to accomplish the objectives in that paper. So one of the results in that paper already calculates um, the exponential order of the partition function. Um, this, is, this is something, this is a quantity that in physics lingo is called the free entropy. And uh, we are going to build upon that and in fact use some of the um, technical results from that paper. And other papers, other articles have investigated the uh, behavior of dynamics. So for example, um, there's a result that shows torpid mixing of Glauber once you are separated from a particular temperature value that we are going to encounter in due course again called um, the Gibbs uniqueness threshold. There's a result about um, the swenson wong dynamics which we are going to revisit um, later in a little bit. And on the other hand there's positive results, so positive results that show rapid mixing of certain um, processes for inverse temperatures below the uh, uniqueness threshold. And in particular, one, one aspect that we are going to revisit as well is um, something called phase coexistence. I mean, the, the existence of metastable states for beta at or near um, another threshold beta P that we are going to look at. And, um, the contribution of the present work is that we basically complete the picture that was begun by some of these references and uh, fully uh, get a handle on um, the metastable states in the system and um, the behavior of dynamics to the extent that um, we can, uh, yeah, to the extent that we can hope on the basis of the belief propagation mechanism. So, um, like I said, I mean, the kind of the in the background, in the back of my mind, I have this belief propagation mechanics. And um, a priori, this is not a rigorous method. This is not a rigorous um, way of analyzing random structures. But as a heuristic, it has turned out to be extremely helpful. And um, the objective here is going to be that we draw on the intuition provided by belief propagation and then find um, some mathematical justification for some of these predictions. Um, belief propagation is a message passing scheme, which means that with each edge of our graph G, we associate two messages, one from the vertex V to the vertex W and one in the reverse direction. And these messages are um, probability distributions on the set of colors. So the message, um, each, each of these messages is a probability distribution on the set Q of colors. And um, the intended combinatorial meaning, which if you think about it a bit, doesn't quite make sense, but sort of the, the intended meaning is um, to represent what the vertex V would do if the vertex W were to be removed from the graph. So um, basically, this message from V to W about some color is supposed to indicate um, how much the vertex V would like that color if vertex W were to be removed from the graph. Now, the obvious problem with that intuition is uh, that we have a strong symmetry in our POTS model. So specifically, if I told you that, um, I mean, how much do you like color S if somebody else is removed? The answer would be just, uh, well, for symmetry reasons, I like all colors the same. So the obvious kind of set of messages that you could jot down 
for any given graph. Um, the so-called paramagnetic solution would be the collection of messages where all the messages are uniform on the set of colors. Um, however, there might be other good choices of messages which might stem from some sort of a boundary condition or some sort of a metastable state. And um, we are going to see how they come about momentarily. Um, but of course, sort of the, the default messages that you could always plug in would be this paramagnetic solution where all the messages are uniform. Um, so anyway, so bear with me one second and try and maybe take on board this intuition, which doesn't quite make sense, that um, the message from V to W is what V would do if W wouldn't be there. Um, if we kind of put ourselves in this mindset for a moment, then we can, with a bit of goodwill, um, derive this so-called sum product equation. And the basic idea behind the sum product equation is, um, well, these messages have the meaning that I indicated. And furthermore, um, the neighbors of a vertex V essentially decorrelate. So these, the colors that these guys like to take essentially become independent if I remove V from the graph. So suppose I, I kill this vertex V from the graph, and now I look at, at the other neighbors, um, the neighbors U that V has. Um, then these other vertices down here might somehow be connected, and in fact are going to be connected in our random regular graph through some long um, paths, through some long um, connections here, since our graph is strongly connected and a good expander, there's going to be paths of length, something like log n between these different vertices down here. But um, we are kind of banking on um, the idea that these paths, these long uh, winded paths between these vertices don't really induce strong correlations. Um, in particular, this wouldn't be true on a worst case instance on a an arbitrary graph, like for example, on a lattice graph, because in that case, there would be um, a lot of short cycles. So a lot of times these neighbors would be directly connected. And then um, this belief propagation intuition wouldn't really make sense. So um, we are expecting, we are hoping that these vertices maybe in our random regular graph um, decorrelate. And in that case, what we could um, write down is this equation down here which says that the message that V sends to W about some color um, simplifies into a product over the other messages down here, over the other neighbors, U of V, um, and the messages that these um, vertices in turn send to V. So specifically, um, the, the message that V sends to W about color S, so how much we would like color S if W wouldn't be there, um, turns into a product where I pick up a factor e to the beta for every vertex u down here that also chooses color S. And um, the other vertices just give me a factor one and then we normalize. So if we presume independence of these other vertices down here, then this formula hopefully might seem to make some sense. And um, the nice thing about these, um, and now kind of we can take this, this equation or this set of equations that binds all the messages together in one huge system of nonlinear equations and uh, reason just about this system of equations. And um, this is sort of the, the intuition behind uh, the belief propagation formalism. And the hope is that by studying uh, solutions to the set of equations, or if you like, uh, fixed points of this um, update rule here, um, we can extract some useful combinatorial information about our model. Um, now, in general, this sum product um, system of equations may have multiple solutions. Um, some of them may be combinatorial, combinatorially meaningful. 
and some of these may just be analytical artifacts. Um, and so we, I mean, if maybe we have a stable fixed point, a stable solution where a local perturbation is not going to um, send it off the rails completely, um, we might expect that uh, this corresponds combinatorially to a metastable state that uh, is a set of well-defined set of configurations um, where dynamics would dwell for a long time. Um, the good news is that for ferro ferromagnetic models like the Ports ferromagnet, we do not really expect that matters would get any worse. So we would generally expect that on a random graph, these belief propagation equations would um, suffice to um, describe the model. We wouldn't need to escalate to something more complicated, um, to more complicated um, heuristic methods that accommodate, for example, the physics intuition of replica symmetry breaking. Um, right. And so, like I said, um, once again, if you want to approach this model on a random regular graph, and if you believe that we don't have replica symmetry breaking, which means that local effects determine what's happening on the random graph, then um, maybe a good idea would be to first uh, try and analyze this belief propagation mechanism on the local structure that um, determines the, uh, the shape of the random regular graph, namely the random deregular tree. And um, so the good news is that on, a, on an arbitrary tree, in particular on, on a random deregular tree, um, even if you impose some boundary condition on the leaves of the tree, the belief propagation formalism is always going to give you um, the correct description of the Boltzmann distribution. So on acyclic graphs where you don't have uh, cycles, but maybe some sort of a boundary condition, belief propagation is always going to do the right thing. And in particular, you can use um, this formula called the beta free entropy in order to calculate the partition function or the exponential order of the partition function. And as you can see here, um, the partition function sim simply comes out in terms of the um, belief propagation messages, in terms of the solution to this um, system of equations um, that is given by the sum product equations. Um, right. And um, depending on the parameters of your model, um, several different things could occur on a on a deregular tree. Um, the easiest case is something called Gibbs uniqueness. Gibbs uniqueness holds when um, basically, regardless of the boundary condition, um, your belief propagation equations on the uh, deregular tree are always going to converge to the paramagnetic solution. So more precisely, what you do is you take um, a D minus one array tree, a tree where every vertex has D minus one children. You impose any boundary condition that you like after some large enough number of layers. And now from this boundary condition, you launch your belief propagation messages. You launch the belief propagation message passing scheme um, in order to calculate um, the message at the root. And in the Gibbs uniqueness phase, what you will see is um, that regardless of the boundary condition, the message at the root is always going to converge to the paramagnetic solution that likes all the colors the same. This means that um, the boundary really has no bearing on what the root does. You have, um, you have um, long range decorrelations in um, the best, in the strongest possible sense. And of course, we expect this to happen for a given value of D for fairly small values of beta, so long as the model is very entropic. Um, right. And so in general, for other values of beta, there might be more solutions. And um, there's a certain specific value of beta that separates or that, that marks the boundary of the Gibbs uniqueness phase. And um, this value of beta you can calculate uh, in terms of a simple one-dimensional um, fixed point problem, a simple fixed point problem on the unit interval. And specifically, you simply 
look at uh, this equation here, this equation where you um, have one particular favorite color, which would be color one, S equals one, and um, the mu um, S for the other colors from two up to Q are simply one minus mu one divided by Q minus one. And uh, then for this sort of, um, this sort of mu, you look for fixed points of this equation. And um, the uniqueness threshold happens to be the largest value of beta, such that only the paramagnetic solution, only the case where the dominant color is as popular as the other colors, um, solves this set of equations. Um, on the other hand, if you exceed the uniqueness threshold, what happens is that, of course, you get other um, possible solutions to this equation. And um, because we get messages that only have one single parameter and um, are not really dependent on, on anything else, we uh, can simply take um, the solutions to this equation star and plug them into our random deregular graph and obtain further fixed points of the leaf propagation, further solutions to this sum product equation. Um, so again, for beta exceeding beta u, the uniqueness threshold, we are going to see a solution to this um, scalar fixed point equation, this scalar fixed point equation here, um, where the first color is strictly more popular than the other colors. And um, this solution is in fact unique. And uh, we call this probability distribution on the set of colors the ferromagnetic solution mu f. So mu f is uh, the unique solution to this equation here, um, where mu f of one is strictly greater than one over q, and mu f of two up to mu f of q are all the same and strictly smaller than one over q. And um, so the ferromagnetic solution um, then, in fact, corresponds to the scenario where we have one dominant color and all the other colors are about equally popular. In either case, we can work out the value of this beta functional, the beta free entropy. Uh, we obtain some formulas. Um, as you can see, the one for the paramagnetic solution is quite simple. The other one is, uh, well, yeah, it is what it is. It's not so bad. And um, of course, you can um, actually work out the numbers. So for any given value of D, we can, and for any beta, you can work out these numbers. And um, this result from prior work that we are going to build upon um, provides a value for the free entropy of our POTS model on a random regular graph. And this value is simply um, the maximum of the beta free entropies of these two uh, fixed points, the paramagnetic fixed point and the ferromagnetic fixed point. Um, in this diagram here, um, you see exactly these two curves for some particular choice of um, D and Q. Uh, I, I think D is something like seven or eight and Q is also something like seven or eight or so. And um, what you can see is that at some point, so this blue curve down here is the paramagnetic solution, the beta free entropy induced by the paramagnetic solution. And um, this value here where the orange line starts is um, the uniqueness threshold. And the orange line here is the beta free entropy of the paramagnetic solution. So what you can see is that, well, um, the uniqueness threshold occurs here. And then a little bit later over here, um, the paramagnetic solution takes over as the maximizer. So from this, from this point onwards, um, the free entropy on the system of the system is given by the orange line, not by the blue line anymore. And of course, you see that at this particular point where the two lines cross, we get a phase transition. This is where in this model, ferromagnetism kicks in. Uh, before that, you're paramagnetic. And uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, Lena and Maurice for helping me with these figures because they are so much more nimble with uh, Python and Sage uh, than I am. So, um, 
Right, so you, you, you see the phase transition very clearly in this picture. And um, so the way this was proved in this paper was by the method of moments and a brilliant simplification um, of the moment calculations that involved um, operator norms. Now, um, of course, you can ask, well, I mean, is there some meaning to the blue line um, after the phase transition, or is there some meaning to the orange line prior to the phase transition? So does the uh, presence of these lines have any combinatorial interpretation and uh, what actually happens at this phase transition? And um, so what happens is, or, I mean, to, to clarify this, what we can do is we can actually plot um, the beta functional as a function of the value um, mu1 um, for specific values of beta. And so we've done that here for um, beta equals 0 0.67 and for a slightly larger value of beta. And what you see is um, that the fixed points, the ferromagnetic fixed point and the paramagnetic fixed point, correspond to the local maxima of um, these curves. So this local max here on the left um, occurs precisely at the paramagnetic solution, where mu is one on Q. And um, this right maximum here occurs at the ferromagnetic solution. Now, for the slightly smaller value of beta, what we see is that the global max is attained at the paramagnetic point. However, there's also a local max over here at the ferromagnetic solution. And similarly here, um, in the orange case, for slightly larger values of beta, it's flipped. So there we get a local max for the paramagnetic solution and a global max for the ferromagnetic solution. Um, according to our good friends from physics, local maxima of this beta functional always correspond to stable fixed points and um, likely to metastable states. So what we expect is that, in fact, um, in the ferromagnetic regime, where we have the local max, uh, the global max over here, this local max here corresponds to some set of configurations. Um, where you could actually enter and where, where you, if you start a Markov chain over there, it will take this Markov chain for a, a very long time to escape and to get to the paramagnetic equilibrium. And similarly over here, um, here we have the paramagnetic e equilibrium, but if you start from a paramagnetic initialization, it's going to take a very long time to get there. So that's basically the physics intuition behind these pictures. And um, so what I mean by the paramagnetic state and the fer ferromagnetic state we are going to define momentarily. Um, but this is another way of looking at it. So um, this here gives you, um, or this, this picture here shows you for the precise model that we had on the previous slide, the um, expected magnetizations according to belief propagation. So um, in the paramagnetic phase, we of course expect um, that all the colors are equally likely. And then comes a discontinuous jump at the phase transition to the ferromagnetic phase where we expect that um, one color dominates. And you can see that, that it leaps right from one on Q to well, quite a substantial value, 0 0.7 or something up here. Um, so we, we really have a discontinuity. Um, all of a sudden, the maximum switches to another completely different place. It doesn't relocate there continuously or something, but it just leaps to the other place. And um, this is what physicists would call a first order phase transition in this model. Now, like I said, I'm, I would like to investigate these um, metastable states a bit more closely. And um, to that end, I should maybe define the set of configurations that constitute my state. And um, so the first um, state that I can define is the um, paramagnetic state. And the paramagnetic state, in my definition, simply consists of all configurations sigma of, or coloring sigma, so that all the colors are about equally popular up to epsilon times n. There's an n missing here, I'm sorry. So um, the L1 norm between 
um, the frequency of the colors in sigma and the uniform distribution is less than epsilon times n. And um, similarly, we can define the ferromagnetic state. We simply take the popularity of the most um, dominant color um, given by this orange curve, given by belief propagation. Um, there's a correction here because we go from uh, D-array trees to D-regular trees. Um, so we have to correct it a little bit. And similarly, we say, well, uh, my ferromagnetic state consists of all configurations where the color frequencies uh, comply with this equation over here. So again, there's, there's an N missing here, I'm sorry. So, um, the, so we, we simply define these two states in terms of the color frequencies. And um, now the question is, can we actually prove that these um, states trap dynamics? Um, so as a first step, we are going to show, and this is um, one of the main results of this paper, um, as a first step, we show that, in fact, these states exist. I mean, the, the states have some half decent, half reasonable uh, weight under the Boltzmann distribution. And in fact, this is technically the main step that is required to establish matter stability. Um, so first, um, and this is already from the prior work that I quoted about the value of the free entropy, if uh, we are in the regime uh, between um, uh, before the, the orange curve, the steeper curve takes over, um, with high probability, our configurations are paramagnetic. Um, by contrast, once we are on the orange branch of this free energy curve, um, the ferromagnetic configurations dominate. And um, for symmetry reasons, we don't get probability one, but probability one over Q for each of the uh, Q symmetric ferromagnetic states, uh, because every color uh, gets its turn at being the dominant color. And um, then in the other regime, so in the regime where the orange curve exists, but is dominated by the blue curve, um, what we get is that um, the probability of a configuration stemming from the ferromagnetic phase um, is in fact given by the beta free entropy. So this probability is exponentially small, but um, the value in the exponent here is given precisely by the beta free entropy, precisely by the value that a belief propagation predicts. So even though this, um, from an equilibrium perspective, this set of configurations has a tiny probability, it has some positive probability, some probability that is actually precisely the value given by um, the beta free entropy. And analogously, we have the sort of formula for the paramagnetic phase in the regime that the blue curve dominates. So um, this sort of proves the correctness of um, the beta free entropy. And then um, as an application of this, uh, we can actually say something about dynamics. So um, specifically, we consider the Glauber dynamics and Swenson Wong. Um, let me just briefly explain how Glauber works. In Glauber, what you do is you choose a random vertex and then update its color in accordance with the colors of its neighbors. So the probability of picking as a new color or as an updated color S is uh, proportional to X beta times the number of monochromatic edges that would ensue if you were to give that vertex color S. And Spence and Wong is something a bit more complicated um, and in general more powerful than Glauber, but uh, let's not dwell on this. And um, so what do I mean by a metastable state for either of these dynamics? What I mean is a set of configurations such that if you start in that set of configurations um, with your dynamics, you launch your dynamics from that set of configurations, then um, it is exponentially unlikely that you will escape from that set before an exponential number of time has elapsed. Um, 
right? And with these definitions, uh, we can then show that, in fact, uh, for both these dynamics, the um, states SF and SP are metastable in the respective regimes predicted by the propagation. In the respective regime where the corresponding solution is a local max, um, but not dominant. Um, this argument, while a bit delicate in the case of Swenson Wong, is actually not, um, not so, I mean, conceptually not so difficult. Uh, once we have the other result about the Boltzmann weights of the states, because basically what we can simply do is we can simply um, use some sort of a conductance argument um, in combination with some uh, combinatorial arguments and spatial mixing arguments. So I'm not going to talk about this very much. Um, what I'm instead going to do in the last couple of minutes is I'm going to briefly talk a bit about um, how we derive the Boltzmann weights of these two states in the scenarios where they don't dominate. Um, the first thing that you could try to do is, of course, you could try and um, apply the method of moments. You could do a so sort of a first and second moment calculation, um, which, I mean, first and second moment method um, are important tools, but um, sometimes they turn out to be a bit blunt, and they also tend to lead to uh, rather complicated analytical calculations. And that is certainly the case here. So for example, let's suppose we want to calculate the probability of hitting the ferromagnetic state in the regime that doesn't dominate. Um, so then in other words, what we want to calculate or estimate is the ferromagnetic partition function the sum of all the Boltzmann weights on the ferromagnetic state. And um, of course, what we could try to do is we could try and compute the first and the second moment of this random variable ZF. Um, and the first moment um, you can estimate, it comes out as a variational problem. So it comes out in terms of um, maximizing this function F down here. Um, and this function has some entropy term, okay, which is not something to be optimized on, simply just the entropy of the ferromagnetic state. And um, then there's some other term down here, which um, optimizes on a probability distribution rho on Q times Q with marginals nu f. And um, yeah, with a bit of, um, with a bit of skill, you can uh, extract the correct value of this row, the correct maximizer from the belief propagation equations, and then you obtain your first moment. Um, it's not too complicated, and it happens to coincide with the, with the beta free entropy. But um, where trouble starts is when you try and calculate the second moment. Um, if you try and calculate the second moment, you end up with an optimization problem, um, not just on this distribution rho on Q times Q, but instead you have two distributions to optimize on. One is now a distribution nu on Q times Q, which in physics jargon means that you have to optimize on the overlap matrix of configurations. And um, the second thing is a distribution on Q4. Um, which is rho. And again, you have some entropy terms and some um, energy terms corresponding to monochromatic edges. And um, so the main problem here, if you want to approach this analytically, is to find the optimum solution to nu, because once you have nu, the, the remainder turns out to be um, a convex function. So um, the problem is optimizing on nu. And uh, here um, you have a fairly high dimensional parameter, I mean, a distribution on Q squared with marginals nu f. And um, I mean, I for one certainly don't know how to optimize this function. Um, in the case of um, the equilibrium distribution, um, it turns out that you can avoid this optimization, the second moment optimization by way of this uh, very nice operator norms argument. 
But if you are trying to aim for the subdominant states, these metastable states, um, then unfortunately that's not an option. That sort of argument simply doesn't seem to work. Um, so if you wanted to use the method of moments, you would be back to the original problem of um, optimizing on this high dimensional parameter, which at least I don't know how to do. So what we did instead was we instead combined some um, spatial mixing arguments with, um, with another trick um, that proceeds by way of an auxiliary random graph model called the planted model. So um, one ingredient here is a broadcasting process on a B minus one array tree. In this model or in this process, what you do is you choose a color at the root um, from the distribution mu f, from the ferromagnetic distribution. And then you pass um, this color down to the children according to um, the Boltzmann rule, according to the rule that um, your child copies your color with probability proportional to e to the beta and um, doesn't copy your color with the remaining probability. And uh, so this way you pass down this d minus one array tree up to some large level and fix a boundary condition. And um, now you can ask yourself, I mean, for this particular random boundary condition that you created, what happens if you now start from this boundary condition and pass belief propagation messages back up to the top. And um, what happens is in this case, and again, this was proved in the prior paper that I keep quoting, um, what happens in this case is something called non-reconstruction. Specifically, um, if you first go down with this process and then go back up, um, you're going to end up with the a ferromagnetic distribution up here at the top again. So um, this combinatorial process is sort of stable in this respect. Um, the, the boundary condition has no further effect um, beyond just telling you that you're probably in the ferromagnetic phase, uh, nothing else. Doesn't induce any other biases. And um, so this is one, one ingredient that we use. And the second ingredient is a new random graph model called um, the planted model. And um, this is a model that, that uh, has come to play uh, a prominent role in many of these analyses. And um, the planted model is simply an auxiliary random graph model where you choose a graph with a probability that is proportional to the partition function that you're interested in. In this case, um, it's a ZF of G. And subsequently, you um, then want to investigate samples from the Boltzmann distribution of this random graph. And uh, through a stroke of good fortune, it turns out that this model is usually much more amenable, much more approachable than the original random graph model. Um, and this is because of um, a combinatorial identity called um, the Nishimori identity. So specifically, we can um, reasonably well analyze samples um, sigma hat from this particular distribution. And in particular, we can show that locally, if you look at the colored neighborhood of a random vertex in this planted model, um, the constellation of colors that you are going to see converges um, precisely to this broadcasting process. And therefore, because on the broadcasting process, we have this forgetfulness property, this non-reconstruction property, that the boundary condition basically memorizes nothing beyond the fact that you are in the ferromagnetic state, um, we can now analyze um, overlaps of independent samples of configurations in the planted model. And in particular, we can prove that in the planted model, if you, if you draw two configurations randomly, um, then their overlap, um, the agreement between the colorings that you're going to see, concentrates on a particularly simple point, on a particularly simple overlap, namely simply just um, the product measure. And um, therefore, um, with a bit of um, 
yeah, with, with some hints from physics and um, in particular the so-called Nishimori identity. This tells us that actually in this complicated um, variational problem over here, there's really only one single point at which we need to evaluate this function. And that is the um, value nu that is precisely the product measure. And at that value, it is a cinch to really evaluate this function. It's very easy. You get precisely the square of the first moment, and then um, you obtain the desired result about the Boltzmann weights. So um, yeah, I guess that was it. Um, I, I guess the main technical idea here was to use the planted model in combination with this spatial mixing idea in order to estimate um, even not even subdominant metastable states and then to work out what implications that has on dynamics. Um, so we managed to verify um, the belief propagation predictions on metastability in this particularly simple model. Of course, there's many more, uh, much more intricate examples, much more complicated models that one could study. Um, but at least in this particular case, we were able to establish the predictions of belief propagation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.